Welcome to Denver Startup Week. I'm Tammy Dorr, President and CEO of the Downtown Denver Partnership and co-founder of Denver Startup Week. I'm so excited to bring all of these dreamers and visionaries together. Our country was built on capitalism, entrepreneurs drive that, and we could all use a little bit of dreaming right now. We're able to bring Denver Startup Week to this community thanks to our sponsors. Join me in thanking our 2020 Denver Startup Week sponsors. Our title sponsors, Downtown Denver Partnership, J.P. Morgan Chase, Prologis, and Zero. Our track sponsors, who have made all of the great content you're hearing today possible. Battery 621 and the Public Works, Capital One Cafe, Colorado Lending Source, Friday Help, Quizlet, Exactly, Zayo, and Zestful. Our headline event sponsors are bringing the excitement of this week to you. Thank you to Wix, Kenzen, MAPR Agency, Obsidian HR, Kickstart Fund, Promontory Mortgage, Molson Coors, and Comcast. And finally, thank you to our partner and member sponsors. They're all listed on the screen. Please say thank you to these companies as you enjoy our virtual Denver Startup Week. And don't forget, use hashtag Den Startup Week to share your experience and moments of inspiration on social media. Hello, I'm Sal Gentili, CEO of Friday Health Plans, and we're proud to sponsor the growth track this year at Denver Startup Week. We're a company that just entered a rapid growth phase, so we felt it was particularly appropriate. When my business partner and I started Friday Health Plans five years ago, we knew we wanted to create a company that catered to people who bought their own health insurance. The Affordable Care Act was just getting going, and we saw an opportunity to serve a brand new market of health insurance consumers. Independent consultants, startup groups, gig workers, service industry workers, designers, creators, and other independent professionals, like many of you here today. We knew that if we built a health plan that was simple to buy, easy to use, had great customer service, and most of all was affordable, we could compete against the big insurance plans who only focus on serving big companies. After spending five years getting into the Colorado market and completing a successful proof of concept, we successfully closed a $50 million round of growth funding earlier this year. We're now about to expand to three additional states later this year, hire more than 400 employees to support our growth, and eventually be in more than 10 states by 2025. I wish each of you good luck in your startup and growth pursuits. And as you think about your upcoming health insurance needs, I hope you consider fellow growing startup Friday Health Plans. Open enrollment starts November 1st. Check us out at FridayHealthPlans.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Denver Startup Week. I'm Jake Cohen, the Growth Track Chair and member of the Denver Startup Week Organizing Committee. Thank you for joining us for the first ever virtual Denver Startup Week. If 2020 has taught us anything, it's that we are more powerful when we come together as a community and share ideas that help make each other better. And here we are virtually showing the world what Denver is made of. At Denver Startup Week, we strive to make all of our sessions a space where attendees can connect, learn, and grow, regardless of gender identity, gender expression, race, ability, sexual orientation, or the intersection of these identities. There is something for everyone at Denver Startup Week, and thank you for joining us today. Now over to you, Ted. Excellent. Thanks so much, Jake, and thank everyone for joining. I'm going to share my screen here in just one second as we get ready. Second here.
Jake, are we coming across? No, you guys aren't um, coming across yet. All right, let me, uh, let me try and restart this here. Here we go. All right, we're looking good? Yes, you look great now, thank you. Great, thank you for that moment. Oh, great, even, even, even better. Um, well, awesome, well, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. I know that there was a lot of options, uh, great schedule. Um, it, again, as the intro said, uh, it's kind of nice to have a little bit more of a national feel uh, this year. Um, and so, uh, as you were looking, uh, you know, of course, putting together different schedules, catchy titles can sometimes be misleading. And so today I promise you that we're going to actually talk about a website agency's guide to why you might not need one. And to be perfectly honest with you, I've been looking forward to having this conversation, uh, for about three years, uh, which might sound a little wild, but. Uh, three years ago, uh, Denver Startup Week uh, was when Click Studios, which were originally based out of Chicago and expanded into Denver as one of the first new markets uh, where we uh, really enjoyed everything that was going on. Uh, and Denver Startup Week was one of our big kind of forays into uh, your community out there. We ran a session called Is a Design Sprint Right for Me? Uh, interesting that as I look at this picture from that session, I'm evaluating this speed uh, distancing uh, for the world that we're in today. But at the same time, that also creates opportunities for me to participate a little bit. Uh, I'm currently based in Chicago uh, in that part of the team. But three years ago, we had a really fun uh, 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 session that was very interactive. Uh, we taught a lot of different startups, uh, different methodologies. Um, primarily folks around the design sprint. And it actually resulted in, uh, uh, we used the Denver public art uh, that you have around uh, your entire area as the topic. Uh, and it resulted in actually a wonderful website uh, that is out there that we're very proud of. So today I'm hoping to continue the trend of giving to your community, uh, particularly your startup community. Uh, and hopefully this is a value style standpoint that way. A uh, little bit about me. I'm Ted Novak, uh, one of the founding uh, partners and currently managing director of Click Studios. I'm based out of Chicago. I have two children, uh, six and eight. I negotiated with them heavily uh, to be able to have this moment of bandwidth, uh, in internet speaking. Um, have been uh, running Click Studios, uh, or I should say co-running Click Studios for the past 15 years. We've got about 45 uh, plus employees. We're now in Denver, Chicago, and Austin. We're working with startups all the way through Fortune 500 companies. We've launched probably uh, close to 600 uh, websites in the market. Uh, and to be honest, I'm also, I'm also pretty tired today. Uh, yeah, but with that being said, uh, I'm not tired of all that. I, in fact, I think I would never get tired of all that. I know I'm talking to a lot of entrepreneurs as well. And I think that's important that uh, the challenges that we uh, come after uh, really kind of give us energy. Uh, and that's, I think, what excites most of us. But I am tired of a couple of things uh, in, in the context of this conversation today. You know, the first is the thought process that a website is a six to nine month engagement. Um, sometimes it does have to be, but not all the time. And I think that's one of the delineations that I want to help people understand uh, today. I'm tired of huge budgets, right? Well, okay, that's silly, of course, as, as an agency, we love, everyone loves big budgets, but huge budgets that are spent on one project with really nothing afterwards, right? And so one of the other takeaways that I'm hoping to provide some insights on today is how to look at how you spend on digital, right? And the sequence and what to expect afterwards. Also tired of small budgets. But again, in the context of 
when it prevents teens from getting the help they need. There's a lot of uh, misunderstandings in the market on where can I find expertise and how can I right size that expertise to help me for what my budget is. A lot of technologies that are out there are making it easier than ever to be able to seek out experts to help you where you need to go versus having to sign up for a big giant project, big giant technology platform. So we'll get into some of that too. Uh, I'm tired of treating everything with the same priority. If you think about uh, some of the other endeavors, whether it was a website endeavor, maybe even the startup that you are working on, there are a lot of things that are components to that, but some things matter more than others. And so often do we approach everything with a degree of priority before we're able to take advantage of those things that really matter. So we'll talk about some phased approaches and, and ways that you might wanna look at releasing things sooner that can benefit you while the rest catches up. Also, I think I speak for all of us bassoon players, just tired of them. I mean, they got the two double reed instruments, like the tallest windland, uh, woodwork, <laughs> woodwind instrument in the orchestra. Uh, I think you all know what I'm talking about. I mean, I've just kind of had it with those folks uh, as well. So I'm tired of, of, of a lot of very relevant things in this conversation. Um, but, you know, now that I might have just accidentally, as I'm watching the numbers drop of the bassoon players uh, in the audience, uh, hopefully the rest of you weren't as offended uh, by that. Um, would love for folks just take a moment, uh, and I, I'm going to do my best to cater a lot of the content to who's in the audience. Uh, so some of the primaries, if you want to throw this in the chat, uh, I'll kind of read through. I might be able to not be able to address every one of them. But I was like, kind of know like knowing who I'm talking to. And my imagine, or I would imagine that many of you are in some place uh, from a startup, uh, whether you are just getting started and you don't have a website, uh, we'll touch on things to consider in that situation. Maybe you have a website, uh, but it's one that you cobbled together and you aren't proud of and you're looking to maybe make some next steps where should you make those. Um, you know, in the other categories, maybe you're in the process of uh, putting a website together right now and might have some questions. So feel free to uh, litter the chat uh, with uh, some of these primers and, and kind of however you feel. And I'll do my best to try and cater to the audience going forward. All right. Excellent. <laughs> so let's get into it. So first of all, it's important for everyone, uh, I feel, to understand that your website is an extension of your business. It, you know, whether it is your business and you're selling an online, uh, you know, SaaS product, uh, of, of course it's, it's an extension of your business, it is. Whether you're selling products directly online, you know, e-commerce, B2C, et cetera, uh, or even if you're B2B or professional services, you are being evaluated on your website. It's your 24 hour salesperson. It's a huge, huge opportunity for you to present yourself in the way that saves you a lot of the conversations that you're having as a startup of getting your values uh, out there. So you need one, right? However, I think it's also important to note that a website is not a project. And I think this is maybe one of the most liberate, liberating viewpoints to have as a startup is so many things feel like I have to do this thing to then have that thing. You know, a website is a living, breathing tool. I mean, it's a wonderful piece of technology. First of all, it's digital. You can update it anytime. What it says on it, what it says on your website today and your value proposition or mission statement or these words you spend a lot of time on, it can say the exact opposite thing tomorrow if you wanted to, right? You're committing to a direction. You're not committing to something that you necessarily have to hang on to the entire time. It's scalable, right? You can always add on to it. Uh, much different than a house. A lot of us, uh, if there's any homeowners out there, a lot of us make that decision. We buy a couple of extra rooms if we're thinking about having a family or we're thinking about aftermarket resale and sometimes we never really use them, right? Wouldn't it be great if, uh, if when we're just getting started, we could buy a house with one bedroom and a really cool kitchen uh, that you could just bolt onto later, right? Websites have that. Last one is it's trackable. Different than any other investment that you're gonna make in uh, marketing, well, I should say digital in general, uh, but of all the different things that you're doing, uh, websites is a point where you can get data, continuous data that you can adjust to it. So 
we're all market. Well, most of us are marketers here or no marketers. And so website's a tool. I like to call it a tool box, particularly when thinking of startups. If you think about if you've ever been in contracting or you could probably imagine yourself as a contractor, depending on the job, there's different tools that you're going to use at different times. You might not be bringing the entire woodworking shop with you, right, to a hammer and a couple of nails. And the reason why I point that out is a toolbox you can add, you can put the proper tools into it when you need them and you go out on the job. But the important factor is that you have your toolbox there and you have the appropriate tools that you need at that time. So we are an agency. We work with clients all the time. I have been a startup myself. Uh, back when we uh, started our organization, there was two, right? First there was two. Um, but a lot of our relationships uh, start with some typical asks that come of an agency. And I imagine some of these are some of the asks that you have yourselves. So first is our website, right? This is why I need a new one or why I feel I need a new one. Traditionalist, it's dated, right? It's hard to update. It doesn't have some specific feature that you're looking to add. Uh, sometimes it's very pointed, right? We're looking to hire, right? Our website doesn't cater to that. Or we need better conversions, which is a wonderful question uh, to start off in the traditional ask. Also, relevant to the startup community, I have an idea, right? Sometimes you don't know much more than that and you're reaching out to a website agency to help think through that. Uh, sometimes you know a little bit about it because you've heard some things. You need branding, marketing, I need a website for this thing. I want it to be accessible, right? Well, kind of an interesting insight. Right now in COVID, a lot of, so we get a lot of those requests. Uh, a significant amount of our, our business is inbound, meaning people uh, are reaching out to us asking for help. And in COVID, uh, you know, we're getting a lot of the same requests, but it's getting abridged with some additional information. One is, can my team help to save on cost? Sometimes it's, I just need X, right? I just wanna focus on this one thing, can you do that? Budgets are limited, right? And everything's needed fast. And if you think about it, you know, large scale projects that are you know, eight to nine months, you're making decisions now that you're not gonna benefit from nine months from there. And sometimes that's needed, right? Larger, huge organizations, you know, monumental technology, sometimes it's wildly appropriate. But right now, even in those situations, it's more challenging because our window of certainty is much different than it used to be. If you look back at the events over the past four months, we've been experiencing things as a culture and economy that we've, well, some, some of it historically has happened before, but a high volume, right, for our, where we are currently in the world has seen so much change that certainty has become a tighter, tighter window. And so, a lot of this is coming up uh, with today's asks. And what I think is interesting about this is, you know, COVID or not, and honestly, startup or not, these are the right asks to make, right? Uh, instead of, you know, approaching a project saying, I need that thing, I want that thing. You know, thinking about cost, thinking about how can your team be involved, thinking about how can you get speed, right, without skipping a step. These are all important. So what I first want to start off with is just give a couple of questions that I think can help get you to what might be important to ask about. And it's going to be different for everyone, but I think this is kind of a helpful construct to think through that. You know, so these are questions before you are asking for help, right? So the first one is, what problem am I, am I trying to solve? And I want to be really deliberate with the singularity on problem, because we all have problems. Right? To use some of those examples, I need marketing, I need branding, I need advertising, I need a website, I need to know who my target audience is, I need to know what my messaging is going to be, right? But I really encourage you to focus on what is the key problem. You can replace problem with opportunity. Perhaps I should have presented it that way. I like using problem because it's the uh, uh, kindergarten design process, right? We start with the problem. Um, but in this exercise also, uh, if you're having difficulty narrowing that down, try asking the three whys. And you can Google this. Uh, I got introduced to it uh, by learning about Ricardo Simler. Um, but the idea is, is you put the initial question out there, you keep asking why, you keep asking why. So for example, I need a new website. Why? Well, it doesn't represent my brand. Well, okay, well, why does that matter? Well, 
because I'm trying to get more conversions through my website, right? Aha, right? We can focus on that. Or it doesn't match my brand. Okay, well, why does that matter now? Well, we've got a big uh, presentation coming up uh, or we're gonna be going to a conference and I really want people to know that we're someone new. Okay, cool. So it doesn't sound like we're talking about a giant project. It sounds like we're talking about maximizing an impact in time for your, uh, for your conferences coming up. Right. So just an example of ways to use the three whys and really narrowing it down to that specific problem, because the more you get specific on that, the more talking to others and experts, they can help you determine what areas to focus on uh, versus taking it all on. OK, next one, what can deliver measurable value to address that problem? And I say measurable because I encourage everyone to take advantage of the fact that anything on your website is trackable. So meaning, if you put something out there and, and put it out there first with good intent, you're going to start getting data, right? And data is really the key to a lot of the answers that we have as entrepreneurs and startups. Will people buy this, right? Will I say the right things? Will they understand me over others? Will they understand my value proposition? Will it work? Right now, I imagine, depending on the state that you're in, a lot of you are some in concept stage, right? You're talking to people, getting feedback, seeing if it's a good, viable idea. You're considering things like minimal viable uh, uh, products, etc. The cool thing about this site is it gives you data that is real, right? I think a lot of times uh, entrepreneurs will find that a lot of people say, I would totally buy that. But once you launch it is when you really kind of understand it. So think about what's measurable. It might help you get information uh, eat on, the, on the way to conversions. Uh, next, what's not necessary now? I think this is the question that is uh, maybe most important and one that I think people are starting to look at differently, right? We've got a set of beliefs when it comes to website. I need a homepage, I need an about page, I really need to tell my story differently uh, because I'm special and different, right? I need uh, a contact management system. I need uh, a marketing engine. I need X, Y, Z and all these things, right? Well, what we find time and time again, clients large, it is large and small, small and large, uh, is that typically the more you try and pack into a single engagement or single process, the less you're going to really hone in on what's important. And a lot of the times, a lot of the features and things that you put into your toolbox that you thought you might need, you end up not using. And again, what's interesting and awesome about digital and a website is if you didn't bring the tool along that you might need down the line, you can always add it in when it's relevant and add it in when you have intent. So as a result, uh, Typical engagements, website projects can easily look like this. And I'm speaking to both the startup community and large community at all. You know, 50 to hundreds of thousands of dollars, even some million dollar engagements, right? Six to nine months. And it's just very interesting for old decisions to get launched, right? Depending on, on how your process is. There's tons of time on stuff that matters very little. Uh, if you've ever been part of a website launch, if we were chasing around content for pages that we don't even didn't even know that we had when we started the engagement. Um, and the biggest one is your budget spent, right? It's very much a gamble. It's a large gamble. It's a long time investment. It's a delay to market, right? Now, if you take a focused engagement, which is what, uh, what my intent is, is to give ideas uh, on how to do today, uh, you can be looking at four to eight week turnarounds, right? Spending time on what matters most like, and delivering that, putting that out there. Uh, anything you put out there, you're going to get performance data to guide the remaining decisions. Again, back to the house metaphor, wouldn't it be amazing if you could buy the three rooms that you spend the majority of your time in, and then when you decide to grow family or decide to sell it, you can add those things on at that point. Pretty cool. Um, you have remaining budget. I think huge, particularly for startups, every dollar that you invest, whether it's yours or an investor's, needs to stretch as far as can go in the right way, right? And the last is actual conversions. Until you have something out there, 
you don't really know who's going to convert. And more importantly, you can't, right? So a focus engagement for a startup, you're dealing with less waste, speed to market, faster opportunity for return on investment, and you're getting actionable data, right? Much different, much more valuable to get data from actual interactions with your brand, uh, because it can be, it, it really kind of gets to the point on where you might get misled otherwise. Okay, so really what we're talking about is spending smart, right? And I'm seeing some of the uh, uh, questions come up in chat about when to, when to hire, uh, exact, access exactly what is needed, right? So I'm gonna get into that because really what we're talking about is how to spend smart. Where do I focus my energy? Okay, step one, to find out what matters most, make friends with data. I just dated myself on this screen here. Whoops. Okay, so I don't wanna waste your time with stats that you can find by Googling yourself, but I will highlight a couple uh, that'll quote, right? Only 55% of companies currently conduct any degree of UX testing. Now I saw that some folks in here are from the agency world as well. There is an opportunity for you, right? To help that other 45%. But also I think what's important here is if you're not on the majority side, you're a little bit behind in this, right? This is a trend that's growing. And, and trust me, 10 years ago, the word UX didn't exist and trying to have these conversations was challenging. Uh, now it's proving to be the trend and there's a reason for that. If you understand your user, you can understand how to position to them. And you're not gonna understand that if anything if you don't have something out there to collect data on. Next one, 75% of people uh, form their judgment on a website's credibility period purely on its aesthetics. Uh, I've believed this stat since before it was printed. This is recent, I'll post sources later. Uh, people want to build a connection with a brand, right? People react to insights and information, analytics and ideas gets attention, but emotion is where people take action, right? And that's what your website has a huge opportunity to be, right? To capture that emotion and putting it out there and doing it the right way. Right? So there's a message here that whatever you do put out there, this is something to focus on, your users and a professional look. So less is more to use an old adage. And uh, with that said, prior, prioritize for impact. It's not making friends with data, it's making friends with your data. And I really, really wanna drive this home. There's a lot of great insights and market trends, particularly in the world of UX that suggest things that others have done. Take that, use that, right? But there's another component to that, which is where are you unique in that conversation? And you're never gonna find that using 100% best practices. If we all use best practices, we'd all have the same website. In fact, you see that every year, we call it that site, right? Back in 2015, it was one banner with one button and then three different, if you're this, click here, if you're this, click here, if you're this, click there, scroll down and see some credentials, maybe see a couple of awards, right? Um, those trends are now changing. We'll even touch on that. So make friends with your data, which means you need to get to your data. Here's what comes out when you take a look at your data. So I thought I'd share some of this. Uh, the but not these means, but not these, you can't necessarily find these out on Google. So I open by saying we've got, you know, over 600 websites uh, out there, right? And a lot of those, uh, we are helping out with the analytics. And so without being too specific, wanted to grab just a couple of trends uh, to, to really kind of demonstrate by why knowing your data can be important. So we took a look at some B to C services. So think plumbers, think painters, think window cleaners, think right, you, uh, a B to C service, something that is wildly commoditized, right, uh, or can be. And the belief is that, well, our story is gonna make, make the biggest impact. Well, it's kind of interesting. If we take a look at a cross section uh, of stats, and there's you know, some rounding in here, um, this is representing the, where the primary site traffic is going. So people who visit those sites, where are they spending their time, right? 55% of visitors are hitting the homepage. 25% of the visitors are hitting a group service and blog together because depending on how the site is structured, 
uh, those are done a little bit differently for SEO purposes. Um, but are looking in the details of the service or reacting to content uh, that they're putting out there. Uh, typical thing that we see in the B2C place is if you're putting helpful content out there, how to do X, how to, how to paint a house, if I'm talking about painting, uh, that is really attracting people, they're diving in and they're going through conversion. The about us is about 1.4%, right? Uh, in this example. Now, there might be specific data specific to you and that's my point, right? Is rather than jumping on this and saying, I had a B2C project, my homepage, my blog and my, uh, and I don't care about anything else, is looking at understanding this, you know, where might a B2C service business want to focus based on these trends, right? And this is a cross section of over several data points in this category. Because not a lot of people are paying attention to the rest of this. Pretty compelling. I'll pick on my industry for a little bit. I know some of you are in it. Uh, so a B2B service, a web design studio, consulting practice, right? Financial services. We take a look at this and, you know, think about uh, think about where you spent your time on your website. Think about where you're continuing to spend time on your website. I mean, this paints a pretty clear picture and very interesting enough, not too dissimilar from what we typically would think would be a totally different market space, B2B versus B2C. Buyer behaviors are starting to merge when it comes to their expectations for what you have online, as well as how they are behaving online and how they're using websites to make decisions. And it makes sense. Whether you're in the space of hiring a B2B service, you're spending your day interacting with things like Amazon, doing searches on Google, right? We are all consumers in one form or another in our daily lives. And as a result, we're getting trained on what those expectations should be. So kind of interesting to see that there's not that large of a difference. But what I wanna focus on here too is COVID, uh, because at the time that we're in right now, uh, some of the trends here uh, alter this pie chart a little bit. And what we're starting to see is blog traffic is really gaining some strength, particularly in B2B, where people are putting content out there to help. And if you think about it, it makes sense because a lot of marketers who are typically people who hire a B2B service, or marketers or whatever your relevant market is, right? But employees of a large organization um, have had their hands tied because of uncertainty, right? Spending has been different. It's been more focused. So people are looking to find ways that they can do something in instances where they're not sure what to do. So content is king more than ever. But if we take a look at this, homepage is still driving a lot of those uh, initial stories, right? Uh, put a little side note here. If you happen to be a very small agency. Uh, trends that we are seeing is the about us page and viewing the different people uh, is actually dominating the services, which also makes sense there too, because services are more of a commoditized thing. Oh, you build websites? Cool. I get it. Let me look at your portfolio. Let me look at your own page. Let me read your content. Who are you is what people are trying to understand. And so for smaller organizations uh, featuring your people uh, or yourself, uh, the statistics we're showing on clients that fit in that category uh, is actually superseding the services as the third ranking area. And I think this is interesting too that I want to point out. So we, we do a lot of work uh, in both e-commerce and venues. Um, I grab the venue content uh, for no other reason than to just make a choice today. Um, but what I want to highlight here too is if you look a lot across a lot of industries, a homepage is a real, real, real dominant place, right? And most of us might know this, but it's not always the first entry page, but it gets hit a lot. The stats show it, which means it's a place where we can make some assumptions that most people on our site will be here. So if we have things that we want to say or conversations we wanna get into, that is a great place for it. But other industries, it's less relevant because people just want to get down to the brass tacks. So we see this in venues, uh, you know, the events, right? If I want to go to a, a concert, I won't name a name of any band because I might date myself. If we want to go to a not bassoon player concert to camp on to that silly joke at the beginning, um, we know the venue, right? We know something about you already. We want to see what you got. We see this in e-commerce as well, right? People want to get directly to products 
Typically they're coming there from paths where they came off the search and they land on that page about your product. And the reason I wanna highlight this here is I know many of you startups are launching some kind of product, right? And if that is the case, and especially if it's a physical product, especially if it's a B2C project, Think about how much time you spend on that actual product detail page versus your homepage that they might never see. And we see a lot of this where people spend a lot of time on other areas describing the values and how great it is. Well, the first entry point in a lot of cases is going to be what came up in a search result and what ranked well. So with that being said, it's understanding this data that helps you understand what to do with it. And I want to uh, uh, double down on that statement, um, you know, you have to be careful not to misinterpret, right? Um, for example, uh, if you take a look at a website that maybe only 3% of your traffic is uh, going to the About Us page, that also might be 90% of your conversion rate. So again, data is awesome. Your website can show this to you. Uh, a recommended uh, search for the DIYers uh, or talk to uh, an S SEO expert, but Page value is one of the things to look at, which is really the average value that uh, a poor page on your site uh, that a user visited before converting. And so in order to get that data, it requires a little bit more of a detailed setup of your analytics. Right? And by analytics, I'm referring to Google's, right? In terms of setting up goals, tracking conversions and setting everything up correctly. But once you have that, you can literally know what was the path that somebody took and then you can start looking at trends. When people read this, they convert. People are all attracted to this great article uh, that I wrote on my blog site, but it's not going anywhere, right? So getting into the data is key. Uh, I'll even speak tactical in terms of what to do uh, with that data that you have. So just got done showcasing uh, that home pages typically a part of that story and where people will be and where you might want to spend some time. So here I've got kind of a wireframe of a, a typical homepage. And actually that's a, I'll call that a 2015 homepage. We're in 2020, right? So homepages are starting to look like this, right? A lot of scrolling. By the way, I'll just set the record straight. Yes, people scroll wildly influenced by the domination of mobile. We, we hear a lot of mobile first, mobile design first. That's what we're talking about is the experience, not necessarily build it for a phone first. But take a look at a homepage of, of a typical type of website, right? You've got your big impression, your hero shot. You've got your navigation in some format. Uh, by the way, if we're talking about scalable websites, using a compressed navigation makes it infinitely scalable. This is cleverly referred to as a hamburger stack. And I'm sure many of you have experienced this. Users now understand what this is. And if you think about a scalable website, you click this, it can have two pages, it can have 10 pages. There's all different ways without having to go back and disrupt your initial design. We then think about the story in the page, right? A well-designed homepage is going to admit that it doesn't know which one of your target audiences are on it at that moment. So you wanna create something where people can explore uh, see what they want, right? Uh, you'll see a lot of engagement used on home pages and animation. People will scroll the page more if it's fun to interact with. And so I'm essentially presenting a wireframe of a well thought out uh, over, over generalized strategy of pairing calls to action with content of interest uh, as people go down the page. But we're talking about a website that needs help, right? So either, either you're a startup that has a site that you put up there in the meantime, and once things start moving, you're ready to really kind of commit. Uh, or if you don't have a site yet, this is a good place to start. But let's pretend for a moment that you had a site because I'm talking about what to do about the key pages on your website and how might you do that? Because there is a belief that I need an entire website to do anything. So homepage alone, if we dissect it, a concerted design and messaging effort specific on the homepage actually has value that's gonna to spread to the rest of your site. So if we break it down, you've got essentially your header and footer that frames up all the content. Now, header and footer are HTML terms, but usability terms, that's your navigation. That's your user experience. That's how you're navigating people to new things, making it easy for them to find what they want, uh, and really controlling the flow of that experience on the site. So a homepage has those components. You address it there in most circumstances, 
the value of the effort that you did on that single design page can be pushed over to your remaining content pages. The next one is that comes out of a design on homepage is you're updating the CSS and it's a technical term, but basically the styles across your site, what a button looks like, what the fonts are, et cetera. Well, in most properly designed websites, all that is be dri being driven by what's referred to as a CSS file, one common spot, which means you update the font in that file, it updates everything. So as you're making aesthetic decisions in the context of reviewing a homepage redesign, that's a benefit that can now spread across everywhere else. Then where you put your effort is this blue area. This is the content, right? Majority decisions are happening below the fold in terms of conversions. And so if you are going to spend, this is where you target those key pages that your data shows, that industry data shows, uh, that's going to make an impact. And the nice thing is, is all the rest of your content in pages are gonna be flanked with these strategic decisions, your navigation, your aesthetic, and you don't have to spend money for someone to create that content, unless you just want the help. But it's areas where you can have a significant impact on your site. We, and we've done a lot of projects like this. We do three pages, address this, and the whole website looks different, right? And then instead of investing on all those uh, additional content pages that might not be as useful, you can see how people are reacting to it and then decide where to, where to put your investment next. So it's a way to build a partial house and get that value. Number two, I've got four, by the way. I'll move a little faster here. What am I the best at? This is a question I want you to ask yourselves. And I realize the audience is mixed between entrepreneurs, between marketers, between agencies. But really playing to your strengths is, has so many benefits. And I know it's a cliche statement, but it's, it's actually kind of interesting how often this isn't part of the conversation when engaging with uh, outside experts and help for what you need, right? So another alternative for this would be what's needed that I don't need to be the best at and can handle myself. Right. So what I'm talking about is spending smart. Right. Where are those opportunities and how might I do it? And I'll lead in with some guiding quotes when you're asking yourself that. First quote is, I know enough to be dangerous. And I'm going to attribute that to nobody in this audience. Right. Because we all know what by essence of the actual phrase itself, we're saying we're dangerous. Right. So most of us are moderately rounded on a lot of things and have some very good strengths in others and need expertise in other places. It's really important to identify that. But at the same time, I wanna share another uh, quote that is one of my favorites, which is never outsource understanding. Um, and what I also love about this quote is it comes from the uh, husband wife design team, Charles and Ray Eames, uh, who designed the iconic lounge chair that you've seen in a lot of uh, offices and several other things. And uh, this quote is extra special because it also kind of demonstrates partnership. Uh, and because I don't know which one of them actually said it. And I just think that's super cool, right? Takes a team to deliver something that everyone remembers. So if not you, who on your team? We know that this is a huge opportunity as well. A lot of you have either folks in your organization that know a thing or two about this, a thing or two about that. Right, um, but also you're gonna have individuals using what is delivered for your site, right? So who's gonna be using these tools? Can this experience of building them add value to them personally, right? It's a huge thing. If you've got junior people, involve them with your website engagement, right? Um, also, if they're not an expert, where might they be leveraged? So the same question that I, I would ask yourself. There is definitely an opportunity to have someone deal with everything. And I understand that, I get that, uh, but costs are different. Uh, and you can build teams that match the value to what that cost is. And it's really about putting experts where they're gonna make the most impact and understanding where you can be one of those experts. Um, but I just really want everyone to leave this message. Making your team matter has short-term gains and long-term benefits. Um, projects are better with a team focus, right? And what we have learned over the years is the more that our client is one of those team members and not someone that just interacts with us between the deliverables, better the project, 
better the outcome and everyone comes out a winner because we all have all learned something. And it tends to speed up decisions as well. It tends to make you confident in where your options are uh, and a strong recommendation when we're looking to spend money smart is how can you use your credit card? Three, technologies. Uh, and I'm gonna say scalability from flexibility. So there's a notion that what I build today, I want to be able to scale it later. In fact, I've said it probably 20 times in this conversation. I agree. However, if we take a look at an approach to that and we kind of think back to that toolbox, what do I actually need right now, right? So do I need to have all this stuff so that someday maybe, or can I also achieve scalability by just building what I need, right? Or building what I need in a way that it can be trans transferred, right? So I think this is interesting. We uh, talk to uh, a lot of uh, marketers, uh, both clients and just colleagues and, and community. And I know that the question, because I get the question all the time is, we need a site that we can update. It's gotta be easy to update. And I agree, by the way, totally agree, mostly. Because if we take a look at what you're going to focus your content updates on, which is wildly important, uh, within the first six months to a year of your site, it's gonna be the blog, the news, whether you call the blog something else that's a little bit more interesting than the word blog, but areas where you're putting up frequent updated content, right? That's sometimes independent of that giant message, your products, right? And your homepage. And quite honestly, that's it with some exceptions. Um, note to almost everything else. And one of the things that we find is a lot of time will be spent building out content management systems to support every single scenario of a page or content that needs to be on the site day one. And by the time folks come to go and update it, usually the reason for that update is deeper than a text change anyway, right? It's usually because we wanna talk about ourselves differently, right? And it turns into redesigning a page anyway. Not because the site wasn't scalable, but because that's what scaling is, is the ability to change what you have out there without getting rid of everything else. And that's really important. Scalability is flexibility when it comes to digital, uh, in most cases, as it refers to content management systems. And again, uh, I will take ability to understand performance uh, over uh, all the tools in the box, right? So again, Analytics is going to give uh, great data, expert set is gonna give insights and ongoing evaluations can drive those decisions. Okay. Hedging bets, I think this is my last recommendation. So I, interesting enough, talking to a lot of startups right now um, and you know, we really kind of took off as an agency back in 2009, 2010, uh, which was the last I use the word recession, right? But I think many of us might remember how the markets were at those times. And, uh, and we're seeing a lot of the same things happen, right? That's what this week is about, starting, starting something in the midst of everything else. And there's opportunities to help, opportunities to be innovative. Um, but when we are talking about spending smart, I encourage everyone to think about where is there certainty and how do I get more of it, right? So how do I reduce my gambling hedge and my bets? So not designed very well, sorry about that. Uh, but this is a process that I've been using it in a lot of those conversations with startups to help navigate through that. So below are a lot of the questions that we get asked immediately. How do we market this, right? We like, we're an agency, we do this work, we do research, we do branding, do messaging, all, all kinds of stuff to help people find their target audience, their persona and make something that's gonna connect with them, right? Um, so those are a lot of the asks. How do I market it? Who will buy it? What will work best? But if we go back to what's certain, what do you know right now, right? What's certain is that you've got an idea and you need to sell it, right? So how do we fulfill that need? Well, in one format, relevant to this conversation, you're gonna need a website, right? The next is that you're a startup, right? So you should be budget conscious. Even if you have a backing, you should be taking a look at where you're investing everything and make sure that you're investing the right. So the uncertain pieces, there's different approaches here, right? Because the need for how to market something is really gonna be answered by data and money, whether that money is upfront cost in research, 
where that data is from upfront research that is done. It can also be data that comes in off of certain decisions that you put out there and reactions to the market, right? So there's flexibility. And what I'm not suggesting is throw something against the wall and see what sticks. What I am suggesting is that at a certain point, you've got an idea that's pretty solid enough to start having the conversation. And if you're teeter-tottering on different positioning, once you have it out there, you can see how people are actually going to react. So as we take a look to the uncertainty in launching a startup or growing a startup, depending where you're at, these are the different pockets where you don't necessarily have to do it all up front. And I would look for ways, and again, going back to what is measurable, what might be measurable here that I could put into the market now and see how it performs to then make the larger commitments. And what I really wanna focus on here is what will work best. All the data and insights in the world still does not hold a candle to actual conversions. And we take a look at, some, if you're an e-commerce shop, you know, there's Shopify, there's millions of platforms where you can just really accelerate past things that, and, and hurdles and technology investments that, you know, people before us had to spend that six to nine months just to get a website that worked, right? There's so many ways to get, to understand, if you understand what your conversions are, right, whether it's a contact form or a demo of a SaaS platform or, you know, purchasing shoes or something, um, the conversion really puts the rubber to the road. And, and if you have a site out there that is set up with analytics properly, you can see why that's happening with decisions that way. So hedging your bets through a phased approach. So summary, and I wanted to leave 10 minutes for questions. I do have some show and tell, but uh, I, I think we'll move to Q&A. Uh, so again, summary, questions asked first, what problem am I trying to solve? What's measurable in the, in, in, in the results I can get from that? And what's not necessary now? And really what we refer to that is focusing your engagement. And so how to focus, what to know, what to focus on, data, your data, your strengths, right? I mean, it's, the best thing in startups, there's only one you out there and your idea. So you got that covered. Make sure it's a part of the equation. What features are critical now versus things you can add later when you need them? And also where are you certain and how can you get more certain with the decisions that you make today? So what could this look like? I'm gonna rapid fire these and get to questions. So new sites and even current sites is talking about a phased approach, right? Focus on the key pages that are gonna get your message across. Uh, and if it's an old site, focus on revamping the pages that are getting the most traffic. Use what's there to then refine the rest, right? Think about that homepage. We can get a total redesign by focusing on two to three pages of your site and implementing it, right? Real quick, some proof. So we're actually, we've been doing this stuff, right? So uh, I like to call this uh, the tail between two dot orgs, right? We do a lot of work uh, um, in, in the dot org uh, uh, community, nonprofit uh, is what I'm speaking of. And exhibit A or exhibit B is large scale website that just makes everyone happy. Exhibit A is this, Cancer Research Foundation. We executed this project in a fraction of the time of a normal engagement. I'll actually post the link out later. It's a super cool site and just focused on what mattered. As a result, well, other organizations were in month five, six, seven, eight, nine of their project. Two, three months later, they're getting a 500% increase on donations, right? And what's interesting is they had the opportunity to use that to reinvest in the site, but they didn't. They used it for what matters for their purpose, right? The site stands as it, as it was when it was launched. Take an example from an institution, Northwestern Law School, uh, uh, awesome institution globally and, and definitely a gem uh, here in Chicago. Uh, we recently did engagement with them this year. Uh, realized an opportunity to get content out there in a better way, specifically with everything that was going on uh, from a COVID standpoint. Um, we didn't replace their entire website, which is on a totally different framework. We built a specific content hub. We made specific decisions just for that, a dedicated experience that's gonna help drive traffic. Then we went back and we redid their homepage, right? To match it. Two implementations totally transformed the website experience. It's another one, Dr. Delivered Smiles, a startup 
The ask here was to build all the technology so that people could book online for a van to show up in your driveway, scan your teeth, uh, and give you transparent braces, right? So we coached through doing specific steps, 100% of what's on here, brand, messaging, everything. We delivered four pages extremely well. The results didn't have to build the rest of that technology to have the business we wanted. Uh, and I can go over several others. So I'm gonna pause here uh, and take a look at some of the Q and A uh, to make sure we have time. I was, I was watching the count and I saw two. So let me see if I can close up here. Uh, it's not pulling up for me. Hold on one second. All right, well, I'm gonna go to the chat. The Q&A is not popping up for me for some reason here. Oh, I got a new message, cool. Okay, hey, Ted, do you want me to read the questions out to you? Yeah. Oh, that'd be great. Okay, um, so Tulani asks, what is UX yeah. testing? Awesome. So UX stands for user experience. Um, and what it refers to is how are people experiencing the content on your site? And the way that I like to think about it is, will they know what to do when they get to the site and will they do it, right? So UX testing involves a lot of things. There's a couple of different ways of doing it. Uh, to an extreme measure, uh, you can actually video record participants, monitor participants. Uh, there's surveys that can be done, and it's really a culmination uh, of some of those activities, depending on what you're trying to validate, that helps you understand what an actual user behavior is. And it's, uh, it's a next level than simply asking questions. Um, and the reason for that is because it's a study of their behavior. So if you are doing a large, complex application that's online, uh, you might want to go into depth, uh, such as setting up uh, some prototypes before you build, recruiting members from the target audience, giving them scripts to execute, seeing visually recording how long it executes. There's some cool technology out there that will video the person's uh, facial reactions as well as their screen movements. And you get to capture where people are actually getting confused rather than just filling out a survey saying, I, I didn't know where something was. So there's, um, it's a very complex uh, uh, field uh, that I could get into some specifics on if, I, if anyone would like to chat about, but hopefully that answered your question. And Tawani also asked, um, she's new to website here. She is new to websites. And where do you get the info on your website, such as stats and data? Perfect, perfect. So uh, I'm going to answer that in two ways. So uh, one, where do I get info period on if it was our website? Uh, we primarily use Google Analytics, Google Tag Manager, and Google Search Console. So Google products, uh, um, because we're, we're well-trained in them, you can get a lot of information. Um, from a startup perspective, and there's some wonderful tools that go even deeper uh, on that, and maybe some startups in this audience that are building some of these tools. Um, but that is an excellent source, and the reason for that is that it is helpful in understanding the rest of your market because a lot of, uh, a lot of other sites are gonna be using those tools and so you can benchmark. Um, so specifically to how do we get ours or what tools do we use, uh, that's where we're at in that. Some of the stats that I presented on, on uh, today, where did I get those from? Well, we monitor a lot of analytics, right? Uh, across the different types of clients and industries that we work with, we're exposed to a lot of that. So we try to use that to look for overarching trends, um, to look for uh, opportunities, both for our clients and just for industry. Um, so a lot of what I shared today was from different subsets, different sampling sizes, um, to help paint a picture of how you can use actual data to find some trends uh, that matter. Um, and I guess the third one there is, uh, if you're looking for a stat, type, type it into Google and see what comes up. The challenge though, is if you're looking to make a difference, probably everyone you're competing with are working with that same piece of information. And that was kind of my point on a lot of the trend stats that we see 
uh, there is, you can get lost in it and it can take you away from, uh, from your gut and it can take you away from your differentiators because uh, so much is out there that it almost sounds like if I don't build my website this way, it won't work. Or if I don't do these things, it won't work. Um, so, and I just always encourage uh, uh, individuals and organizations to look for their unique proposition. So sometimes we get lost in that, but it is useful as well. I'm reading a couple comments in here. That's what we have in the Q&A today. Great. I see another question in here. 75% of people or 75% of the website's credibility. So this is referring to a stat. Uh, I will find a link to it uh, uh, and send it out there. But the 75% of people, uh, it was 70% of people pass judgment on an organization's credibility based on the aesthetic of their website. And I believe that's a 2018 or 2019 stat. I'll have to check. Great. So the big question is what do you do with all that money? Just saving, I'm just totally kidding. Um, but honestly, hopefully the, uh, there is some pointers in here. Uh, the, the word of the day, I've, I've got a couple words of the day, right? One is focus, right? You are getting started with something. You've got so many decisions to make. I would like everyone to understand that the website is gonna be such a magnificent tool set for helping you through those decisions and getting the conversations going where they need to go. And I wanna motivate everyone to take steps, take smart steps to put it out there, right? Use real feedback where it makes sense. And when you're ready, when you're ready enough, put it out there, because uh, that, that's what we need, right? We need folks like you bringing new products to market and you're gonna know uh, if it's a product that's going to help, if it's in a place to help. And eight to nine month, million dollar projects, things like that, you don't need to go down that path, right? Um, but where you can get help is look for where you might need an expert, right? We're seeing design is a huge one, right? The 75% stat we were just talking about, it's a big deal. Well, it is possible for uh, creative agencies to just do that piece, right? Um, same thing with messaging and content, getting these things right enough. Uh, but really the, the idea is if, if you put it out there sooner and there's ways to do that, um, you don't have to sign up for that big engagement and you don't necessarily have to work with me either. So um, at any rate, with all that, I really appreciate everyone's time. Uh, I'm gonna say the chat and read through some of these as well in case there were some things I wasn't able to uh, address uh, in the questions. Um, I'm gonna post in here also for anyone who wants to um, keep the conversation going or may have additional questions, please feel free to LinkedIn with me. Uh, hopefully this isn't a spam bot. I can post my email address in there if anyone has any direct questions. Um, also our website, and then it, when I was looking at that, uh, it's funny, I sent you my homepage and I sent you a page from our blog, but we do a lot of writing uh, that's meant to be out there to help startups, individuals like yourselves. Uh, it's a really fun one uh, that Natalie Gottko from our team put together on a process that we test on ourselves first for rapid, uh, rapid naming of your brand. So that might be a conversation that's going on for some of you right now, and it's an enjoyable article if anything else. So. Thanks so much for the time. I am three minutes over and that's a record for me. Uh, so really appreciate it. And I will hand it back to you, Jake. Oh, right. Hayden here, I think Jake had to hop off, but thanks everyone. And we'll go ahead and end now. Thank you, Ted.